The Age of Augustus. Part 1. Alright, Caesar's dead. So, uh, where do we go from here? Well, let's do some history and find out. If you were one of the handful of senators that had just forcibly perforated your dictator, your first move would be to get the Pluto out of town. See, the assassins thought that they were about to restore Rome to the full glory of the Republic, but they didn't count on Caesar's massive popularity among the Roman people. Needless to say, they didn't quite get the warm welcome and round of applause they were hoping for, so Brutus, Cassius, and some others pulled a poppy and hightailed it to Greece to build an army. Back in Rome, Caesar's corpse was still sitting there all squidgy-like on the floor of the Curia, part of the Senate was gone, and most of what was still there didn't really like Caesar, so we had a power vacuum on our hands. The current consul Marcus Antonius, Caesar's trusted friend and ally, attempted to brand himself as Caesar's avenger against the assassins in order to rally the people to his side and fill that power vacuum. As consul, he was able to work out a compromise so that the assassins would be granted a general amnesty so long as Caesar's reforms stayed in place. The problem for him, like Caesar, was that even though the people liked him, the Senate, and Cicero in particular, very much did not. So after his consulship ended, Antony bailed to go be governor of Cisalpine Gaul. With Rome divided between dumpster fire and more overtly treasonous dumpster fire, let's leave all manners of fire behind us and jump over to Augustus, who at this point was named the rather less august Gaius Octavianus after his father. For clarity, historians refer to the pre-imperial Augustus as Octavian instead. Octavian was the great nephew of Julius Caesar, and they were decently close despite not being biologically related. At the time of the assassination, he was studying astronomy in Epirus, and after learning that Caesar had died, Octavian rushed back to Rome. Upon reaching Italy, he read Caesar's will and promptly acquired the single most valuable thing that Caesar could possibly have given him his name. From that day on, Gaius Octavianus was known to everyone as Gaius Julius Caesar, the officially adopted heir to the big man himself, and that was huge. So now Gaius, Little Caesar's Octavian, and Mark, all bang anything that moves and drink whatever does in Antony, were both in the race to become Caesar's avenger against the assassins. This was important for both of them because that role would entail not only glory, but a buttload of power. The short of it is that Octavian was successful in this because he was a brilliantly crafty manipulator of iconography and cultural symbolism, and he even convinced all of Rome that Caesar had become a god. The next handful of political movements are honestly needlessly complicated, but the gist is that most people just wanted to be on the winning side regardless of which side that was, so the alliances were almost constantly shifting. Octavian was probably the one encouraging Cicero to give all those angry speeches against Antony, and then after Antony skipped town and went north, he had to wrestle the governorship from another one of Caesar's assassins. The Senate, being markedly anti-Caesar, sided with the current governor and against Antony and declared him an enemy of the state. The Senate wanted to send a legion or two to deal with Antony, but they didn't have an army. Octavian, however, had promised Caesar's veterans that he could pay them if they remained loyal to him. So Octavian, interestingly, buddied up with the Senate to go fight Antony, which on paper makes no sense because, you know, the whole Caesar's Avenger business. In practice, however, Octavian was very pragmatic, and if helping the anti-Caesar Senate fight the pro-Caesar Antony seemed politically expedient for him, you bet he'd do it in a heartbeat. As such, Octavian and the two consuls that year marched up to Mutina against Antony. Octavian's senatorial army won, but both consuls were killed in the battle. When the Senate asked Octavian to give up his army, he said, <laughs> that's a good one, no, and allied with Mark Antony to march on Rome with eight legions and politely request that the Senate declare him consul or else. And they did. With the Senate's begrudging compliance, Mark Antony hopped over to Spain to meet up with his Caesarian political ally Marcus Lepidus. Meanwhile, anybody remember Pompey? You know, first triumvirate, fought a civil war with Caesar, decapitated on an Egyptian beach? Yeah, that guy. So the Senate granted Pompey's son Sextus command of the Republic's entire navy and Sicily to use as a base. Also, Brutus and Cassius were happily serving as governors of Macedonia and Syria, respectively, just doing their thing, having fun, building up their armies, all that jazz. The Senate got a really great deal out of that amnesty agreement. Following the misunderstanding up at Mutina, Octavian buddied up with Mark Antony and his friend Lepidus to form the Triumviri Republicae Constituendi, in English, the Triumvirate for the Reconstitution of the Republic, and in smaller words, the three guys for making Rome not have a civil war again. 
team. Unlike the first triumvirate, which was an informal political alliance between Pompey, Crassus, and Caesar, the second triumvirate, created by Plebiscite, was a legally recognized entity that gave each triumvir full dictatorial power, so everything they said or did was law. Now, what exactly reconstituting the Republic meant was up for debate, but as far as the triumvirate was concerned, the most important matter was taking care of Brutus and Cassius in the East, and financing the armies necessary for that would have been quite expensive. The Senate would likely have disagreed with this because, in their eyes, the formation of the triumvirate was nothing more than the plebeian assembly handing over Rome to a few Caesarinos playing dictator. So the triumvirate had to contend not only with the remote threat of the assassins, but also with local hostility in the Senate. To solve this conundrum, they split the difference and killed all of them. The triumvirate pulled a page out of Sulla's book and drafted up a hit list of Rome's enemies, which conveniently contained about 300 wealthy anti-Caesarian senators and some 2,000 landowners in Rome. The kicker is that everyone's funds were confiscated when they were killed, so the triumvirate conveniently accumulated insane amounts of money in the process of killing off all their political enemies. The prescription started with that initial 2,000 some odd people, but rapidly ballooned to double that. They gutted over a third of the Senate. This was oof, obviously pretty messed up. I mean, it worked, but geez, they killed Cicero and hanged his head up in the forum. There's no way the triumvirate comes out of this not looking like murder tyrants. Civil war is one thing, but this was domestic slaughter. The next big event on the docket for the triumvirs was using their ill-gotten funds to finance a campaign against the assassins. Antony and Octavian led their armies into Greece and met Brutus and Cassius at Philippi. Antony defeated Cassius, who killed himself, and Brutus overran Octavian's camp. But conveniently, Octavian didn't die because for some reason he wasn't there. Suspicious. After that, Antony came back to Octavian's camp and defeated Brutus, who then killed himself. So the triumvirs win, but Antony did all of the hard work, and also Octavian had maybe possibly bailed from the battle altogether. Forget the prescriptions, in the eyes of the Romans, Philippi was the biggest disgrace in Octavian's career. And you can see him trying to make up for it by representing himself through calculated military imagery for decades after the fact. After Philippi, the Republic was somewhat slightly reconstituted, and in the wake of a reconquered East and gutted Senate, the Triumvirs were the biggest players in the Roman world, so they carved it up into East, West, and South. With Octavian taking Italy, Spain, Gaul, and Illyria, Antony taking Greece, Anatolia, Cyrenaica, and Syria, and poor old Lepidus getting Carthage and a little bit of the African coast. If you got the sense that Lepidus didn't matter, it's okay, because you are correct. He did not. <laughs> Poor Lepidus. On paper, things were peaceful and stable, but late Republican Rome being late Republican Rome, it really wasn't. I mean, three people, two people, each controlling a third, half of the Roman world, each of whom was looking to follow Caesar's example of unilaterally ruling Rome, that's fine, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they'll just be totally, perfectly fine. No stress. Part two. In the wake of Caesar's assassination, Roman politics got even weirder than they were in the century beforehand, which, given the persistence and pervasiveness of civil wars, is really saying something. After the military success of the Triumvirate, the collective Roman citizenry hoped really, really hard that it wouldn't immediately explode into another civil war. <laughs> well, bad news, boyos! The Roman Republic had been living on borrowed time for over a century by this point, so realistically, we're looking at four, maybe five minutes tops before it all crashes down. Fun times, right? The period of peace after the defeat of the assassins and the gutting of the anti-Caesarian members of the Senate in the notorious prescriptions was an uneasy one to say the least. Memories of several different battles fought, Italian fields burned and drenched in Roman blood, and family members killed were swirling in everybody's minds, so a lot of people were unconvinced that they were looking at a long-term solution. In poetry, this period is known as the Great Fear, when everyone was really anxious about civil wars. Fearful, you would say, and 100% certain that there would be more of them. Rome's greatest poets of the time, and Virgil both acutely touch on the constant fear felt by the populace. And as it happens, the poets were pretty much right about the big bad specter of civil war. In the East, Antony had been consolidating his power by striking up alliances with nearby monarchs in a bid to accumulate money and military power for his planned campaign into Parthia, but perhaps most importantly, he pulled a Caesar and sauntered over to Egypt to schmooze with Cleopatra. In the West, Octavian had a lot of problems. His land reforms got the sympathy of his legions, but proceeded to alienate the rest of Italy pretty handily, because that's kind of 
what happens when you confiscate people's land and give it to your army instead. In 40 BC, Antony's wife Fulvia led a revolt against Octavian and very briefly captured Rome. Octavian then pushed them out to Gaul and quashed the rebellion, after which he sacrificed 300 of the conspirators. Not imprisoned, not even executed, sacrificed. Octavian performed human sacrifices on fellow Romans on the altar of the deified Julius Caesar. The ancient world was no stranger to animal sacrifices, but when it came to people, Romans did not do that. So, uh, I'm just gonna jot this up next to mass murder of wealthy Romans on the list of Octavian's deeply distressing personality quirks. Now, the golden rule of late Republican Rome is that anyone named Pompey is guaranteed to be a colossal pain in the butt for anyone named Caesar, and that's definitely the case here. Sextus Pompey, son of Pompey the Headless, had been tooling around in the Mediterranean for the better part of eight years following Caesar's assassination, blockading ports and regularly cutting off Rome's food. Octavian was understandably miffed about this, but couldn't really do anything since Pompey had Senate-sanctioned control of Rome's entire navy. Even though the Triumvirate was able to defeat the assassins a few years beforehand in a land battle, they were practically powerless against the only real navy in the Mediterranean. Technically, Egypt had a pretty great navy too, but they don't count because they're, you know, not Roman, and also Cleopatra was solidly in Mark Antony's corner, so not about to help. Anyway, after a treaty broke down and Pompey inflicted a humiliating defeat on Rome, Octavian's general and all-around badass right-hand man Marcus Agrippa proceeded to take matters into his own hands by building up a navy of his own from scratch. The problem was that with Pompey controlling the seas, Agrippa's forces couldn't train how to sail in open waters without threat of being immediately murderized. So the madman digs a lake in the middle of Italy and uses it as a makeshift naval base to train up a fleet, which proceeded to demolish Pompey's navy because Agrippa is a military god. My headcanon is that Agrippa, equipped with nothing but a bucket, a shovel, and a mission, dug the whole lake himself in a night, though archaeology has yet to corroborate my hypothesis. Yet. After Agrippa's solo carry against Pompey, Lepidus attempted to seize Sicily for himself, but Octavian said, whoa, 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 who let you leave the house, and immediately ejected him from the triumvirate, confining him to the priesthood. Was this, by any chance, legal? Eh. So then there were two, moving on. Now, on paper, they were cool, because Antony had married Octavian's sister Octavia after his first wife Fulvia casually revolted against Rome, but in 32 BC he divorced her and officially married Cleopatra, confirming what everyone in Rome already knew was happening for the better part of a decade. Observant viewers will recognize that not being in-laws anymore is the same step in the process when hostilities first flared up between Caesar and Pompey. So, uh, get ready. It's around here that things start going downhill really fast. The Mediterranean was shaping to end in a violent showdown between the muscular military man Antony and the super scrawny strategist Octavian. 32 BC started off with the year's two new consuls delivering what was apparently a devastating verbal smackdown against Octavian. The next day, Octavian showed up in the Senate with armed guards. This strong statement was also a gross violation of traditional rap battle protocol, after which part of the Senate bailed to go join up with Antony in the East. Mm, you'll You'll have to forgive me, it's a little hard to hear with this massive echo in the history. Unfortunately for the senators, they found that Antony's half of the Republic was kind of suckish, so a few defected back to Octavian. But in the confusion, Octavian sneakily got a hold of Antony's will, which, among other things, included the neat little fact that Antony wanted to be buried in Egypt with Cleopatra, and he bequeathed entire Roman provinces to his children with her. Not only was this distinctly kingly behavior on his part, it was kingly behavior in service to a foreign state at Rome's direct expense. Octavian, of course, pounced on this like a cat on an expensive-looking vase and waged an intense propaganda war against Antony, branding him as having been bewitched by scary foreigner Cleopatra and forgetting how to be properly Roman. Octavian, by contrast, painted himself as the pinnacle of Romanness, as his family heritage traced back to the epic hero Aeneas and the settlement of Rome itself. You know, insofar as anyone could trace anything when it came to ancient genealogy. Coincidentally, just as soon as Antony's will was exposed, Octavian also began construction of a giant mausoleum right on the banks of the Tiber River in Rome. <clears throat> Bring on the propaganda fight. But perhaps the most important message that Octavian pushed was that Antony had become a slave to Cleopatra. By framing the problem as Antony was corrupted by this evil foreign queen and her probably mind control boobs, he neatly avoided the touchy subject of civil war. Control over the narrative was key, and Octavian had it. When he entered into war with Antony in 32, all of Rome was convinced that the prime antagonist was Cleopatra, and didn't think that Octavian was making a power play to seize the whole republic for himself. But no time to worry, 
worry about the complex political implications of large-scale conflict because off to war we go! And here, Octavian's controversial land redistribution scheme from a decade earlier paid dividends now that he was able to take the loyalty of several entire legions to the bank. Once again, Agrippa, my boy, comes in clutch. First, he prevented Antony from sailing from his base in Greece to Italy, which would have been a very bad time for Octavian and friends because Rome was not a long march away. After that, Antony and Cleopatra's army set up camp at Actium in northwest Greece, with his supply chain running down to the Isthmus of Corinth and through to Egypt. Agrippa, because awesome is his middle name, proceeded to intercept and cut off Antony's supplies at Corinth and then blockaded him in at the Bay of Actium, forcing a battle. While dozens, if not hundreds of poems have been written to commemorate Actium, I'm not sure there has ever been a bigger anticlimax in all of Roman history. Can I? Heartbreak. Zama? Drama. Everything Caesar did in Gaul? Mwah. Tactical brilliance. Actium? Meh. <sighs> For how consequential of a battle it is, it's shockingly uninteresting. All the actual cool stuff happened before the battle. Agrippa laid on the moves to force the fight, and then after that, Cleopatra and Mark Antony decided that leaving and losing was better than likely losing anyway, plus being captured and probably killed, because... Honestly, fair, so they broke the blockade and bailed. After the battle, everyone just went home. Octavian went back to Rome to tidy up the state and deal with the bread famine, and Antony and Cleopatra went back to Egypt's navyless but alive. The next year, Octavian came to a defenseless Alexandria. Sources are all over the place, but the general gist is that Antony killed himself, Octavian tried to get Cleopatra to come to Rome to be a set piece in Octavian's triple triumph, but Cleopatra pulled a dido by giving Rome the finger through a dramatic suicide, which honestly is entirely valid. From Octavian's, and by extension Rome's side of the story, Cleopatra looks one-dimensional and evil, but that is a woefully inaccurate characterization. Historians have treated Cleopatra Cleopatra so, so poorly. <sighs> In any case, now that our boy Octavian cleaned up at Actium, he annexed the Duat out of Egypt and did who knows what with the bodies of Antonius and Cleopatra, so the totally not a civil war civil war was won and Rome was finally at peace. Yay! Given the straight century of world-spanning turmoil that Rome had just gone through, it should be no surprise that people were really glad about this. In the years that followed, Octavian consolidated his power under the guise of restoring the Republic, even though most people knew and honestly didn't care because they were were either just glad the wars were over or were among the two-thirds of the Senate that Octavian himself installed. Also, to mark his new position, he changed his name to Augustus, meaning the increased one, or majestic. He almost changed it to Romulus, presumably just to mess with historians, so let's be glad he didn't. And that's the near-immediate collapse of the Triumvirate and the final war of the Roman Republic. Bottom line is that while Mark Antony was a very dangerous adversary who could have won had he paid more attention to his wits instead of his wife's, um, let's say, eyes, Octavian had the board tilted in his favor from day one. Not only was Octavian a superior strategist, but he had an exquisite team, finding by far the best general of the day in badass extraordinaire Marcus Agrippa, and winning a crucial propaganda war thanks to his friend Mycenas, Rome's biggest patron of poetry and the arts. As underhanded and downright brutal as some of his tactics were, Octavian's victory reassembled Rome into one piece, and critically demonstrated that perhaps the only way to keep it in one piece was to have one one man in charge. And after coming this far, there was no way Augustus would let it be anyone else. Part 3 at barely 35 years old, Octavian Caesar, the great nephew of one prematurely perforated Julius, was the most powerful man in Rome. In the span of a decade and a half, the impressive young man, as Cicero called him, cleverly swayed the people to view him as the rightful heir to the legacy of his father, Julius Caesar, and struck up an alliance with the prominent general Marcus Antonius to secure his revenge against the Big C's assassins. From there, he spent the next decade consolidating his power in the Western Republic, casting his co-trium where Marcus Antonius as a turncoat slave to his mistress Cleopatra because she was queen of the last non-Roman corner of the Mediterranean, and come on, it wasn't going to conquer itself. After waging and winning a war against the both of them, Egypt got annexed and the Roman Republic was pacified by the might of Octavian, now known by the name Augustus. But there was still one issue. We've been here before, and if things were going to change, what needed to be done next? And how could the Republic really be restored if there's one man clearly more powerful than anyone else? Well, as we'll see, even though the road to the Roman Empire wasn't the most obvious, Augustus, ever the clever little son of a god, pulled it off. First things first, when he returns to Rome from yoinking Egypt, he astutely dodged the subject of whether or not he was going to make like his old man and fashion himself a king. Instead, he pulled a bane and insisted that he was restoring the Republic and returning it to you. 
the people. Indeed, I'm Bane. Um, anyway, and since Augustus had already offed the other two triumvirs, he ditched the now awkward title and resigned most of his official power. But he did stay on as consul and remained the effective governor of Egypt, Spain, Gaul, Syria, and Illyria. So he had insane funds, lots of territory, and most of Rome's legions in his pocket. And that would make for some large pockets. It's like Pokemon, but instead it's just lots of humans, land, and coins in a giant burlap sack. He also took on the generally ceremonial role of Princeps Senatus but since Octavian had stacked the Senate in his favor over the past few years, it effectively meant that he dictated legislation. That was basically his trick. He never changed any core institutions. He just happens to hold several different key positions of extreme power all at once. The totalitarianism was a total accident. Whereas the big C rolled into Rome like, what up, I'm dictator for life, and got immediately murdered because his plot armor wasn't as strong as he thought, Augustus was much more aware of feelings on the ground and played himself up as a peace bringer above everything else. So at this point, no one had the reason, and especially not the means, to start another civil war. Half a decade into his not-quite rule over his not-quite empire, the Senate gave its official thumbs up to his peace-bringing, republic-restoring, Pax Romana-securing ways. And after that, there were statues of Augustus going up everywhere, and coins bearing his face, and a shield on the Senate House with an inscription about how full of justice and piety he is... Okay, nuts. Point taken. He's definitely a king. But now, Romans saw a good king in practice but not in name as vastly preferable to the stabby alternative. Hundred years of civil war will do that to you. The closest brush with rebellion happened a few years into the empire, where a prefect of Egypt named Cornelius Gallus won a small campaign and erected a monument to his victory. Augustus, visibly shaken by the wave of flashbacks to Antony and Cleopatra, mailed Gallus a letter of stern reprimand and then also a dagger for which to impale himself. Gallus, guilty of little more than pride and governing while Alexandrian went down without a fight. After that, Rome collectively kept its mouth shut and Augustus kept a very keen eye on Egypt. On the foreign front, Augustus expanded Rome's borders to more or less what they'd be for the next few centuries. He also secured a peace deal with the Parthians, who had been a particularly troublesome thorn in Rome's side for almost a century, as I'm sure Crassus would tell you if he didn't have gold poured down his throat. On the domestic side, the princeps selected senators, magistrates, and generals to keep everything running smoothly. This allowed him to just go nuts on public works. He subsidized hundreds of temples, including the symbolism-rich Forum of Augustus, which, fun fact, became the go-to place to show off treasures from a campaign, so in later centuries it became too crowded with spoils to even walk through. He also funded Agrippa's Pantheon, the Pantheon, a structure that, much like Agrippa himself, is so impressive it's almost insulting. The gorgeous ocular dome is made of poured concrete, and the light from that oculus shines through the front door on the anniversary of Rome's founding. Agrippa. Dude. I get that you're cooler than all of us, but you don't have to rub our faces in it all the time. Come on! On the literary front, Augustus had his poets working in high gear to crank out some of Rome's best literature. Given what came before, that was a low bar to clear, but this new stuff was pretty sweet. It probably goes without saying that the most famous Augustan-era work is Virgil's Aeneid, a masterful epic poem glorifying Rome's ancient Trojan history. And while Virgil slides in a non-negligible number of digs at his boss, the Aeneid was still a key component of the so-called Augustan program in the arts, literature, and architecture. The celebration of just how dang glorious Rome was and the coolness of Augustus for making Rome its best self. The saying, Augustus found Rome a city of bricks and left it a city of marble isn't strictly true, but it's no secret that Rome was a cultural backwater in Caesar's day compared to, say, Alexandria, and Augustus did a lot to make Rome a place that didn't entirely suck to actually live in. However, it wasn't all smiles in Augustan Rome, as the poet Ovid needs to be absolutely certain you are aware. The short of it is that Augustus tried to impose new laws on marriage, so our boy Ovid decided to write a giant poem about where and how to seduce any man or woman in Rome. As it happens, the how often involved seducing the maid first, which I don't quite follow, but Rome was a different place, so who knows, and the where was pretty much every monument Augustus built. Unsurprisingly, the new emperor was less than pleased at the thought of these wild youths using his carefully crafted highbrow iconography as set dressing for casual hookups and Ovid got exiled to the Black Sea for the rest of his life. Coincidentally, Augustus also 
exiled his own daughter at the same time. One and two may or may not have gone together, but it would have been completely in character for that salacious Ovid. One successful empire later, Augustus died in 14 AD at the age of 75. By the time he died, almost no one could remember what the Old Republic was like, either because they were too young or too murdered. Although Augustus was one of Rome's longest serving emperors, he suffered from a recurring sickness that almost killed him every other year. Yeah, throughout this whole process, not only did he have to contend with Brutus, Cassius, and Antony trying to kill him, he also had to, you know, not die to RNG. And speaking of dying, his heirs weren't quite so lucky. See, being emperor and all, Augustus wanted to choose his successor, so he groomed his nephew Marcellus to become emperor, but then he died. Oh well, that's Roman medicine for you. So then he started preparing his steps on Drusus, and nope, he's dead too. Okay, how about his two grandkids Gaius and Lucius? And are you kidding me? So with options A through D exhausted, succession went to his wife Livia's first son Tiberius. With the benefit of hindsight, a terrible choice, but options were slim, so what'll you do? Well, historians have written about Augustus up and down the timeline. He made their jobs a bit easier by writing not quite an autobiography, but a pretty thorough resume. Upon his death, he published the Res Gestae Dewi Augusti, basically the awesome stuff I did. Some of it is embellished, some of it is straight up lies, but it shows what he thinks mattered most about himself, and it was the stability he brought to Rome. Between the senator murdering and the human sacrificing, it's fair to say that Augustus is a little problematic, and the moderate amount of deception underpinning his entire career is also a bit distressing, but the Romans weren't about to argue with results. Through a long career of carefully strategized political maneuvering, military operations, and cultural production, Augustus laid the groundwork for over a thousand more years of Rome, and that's a feat. His ascent to power was far from guaranteed, but this 19-year-old kid outplayed all of Rome, and one metric history summarized later, this kid was a 75-year-old man who is now also dead. So, with the age of Augustus finished, onward to empire. Thank you so much for watching. I originally didn't plan to re-record this script, but there were some audio issues with the source file that couldn't really be fixed, so yeah well, more work for me. Since I was here, I modified the original script in a few places, but this is still like 98% original text. All in all, I'm really happy with how this video turned out, and this series is such a blast to work on, so I hope you're enjoying it as well. Thanks as always to the patrons, and I will see you all in the next video.